hiding from zombies until dawn. A Diamond Hydra Nature Report, posted by TC Demo to Erawid.org, December 26, 2001. The following is a brief recollection of possibly the most frightening experience of my life. I experienced a kind of irrational fear that I did when I was four or five years old. I remembered that I had swallowed 21 Diamond Hydronate pills, and that none of what I saw could possibly be real or harm me, but it honestly made no difference to the fear and anxiety I felt. Upon the realisation that there was no way I could stop any of what was taking place before me, I slipped deeper into a state of shock and horror. I spent most of the trip with my back against the wall convulsing in fear. It all started out quite innocently. I downed 21 pills with one gulp of milk and waited for the effects to come on. I felt the typical heaviness and relaxation flow over me in waves, and then I realised something was quite wrong. Everything I was seeing was some kind of spider. Little clear spiders were scurrying over everything I looked at. In the darker areas, under my desk, bed, etc., there were huge, more detailed spiders that were coming right for me, but luckily, they dissolved when they came into the light. Then they started crawling on me and biting me. I could even see and feel their bites. It made no sense to me. I'd never experienced anything like this on a drug before, and my sense of confidence and control simply vanished. I grabbed them and squished them, and my hands felt slimy, but there was nothing there. It was like they were actually half real, somehow bridging the gap from my mind to reality. Although anyone can easily see that there were nothing more than convincing hallucinations, I wasn't convinced, and that was enough to water the seeds of uncertainty and fear within myself. I went to the kitchen to get a glass of water, and there was a body slumped just outside my window. It didn't move or shake or wiggle like the spiders did, and it didn't just appear there. It was there at my first glance out the window and remained motionless and unchanging the entire time. I was totally immersed. My skin felt as though I was deep underwater with a constant pressure everywhere. I couldn't go back to my room because of my fear of the biting spiders, so I went to my living room and sat down at the computer. I kept hearing snickering and voices calling my name from behind me, and when I turned around, there was a giant purple white spotted mushroom sitting positioned on my couch, quivering and shaking. It wouldn't go away. I looked away and looked back, and it was still there. I knew it couldn't be real, but it didn't seem to act the way hallucinations usually do. Then, it suddenly absorbed itself into one of the cushions, and it took on the same purple white spotted appearance and began shaking. I could only gasp. Soon everything was shaking and wobbling. The love seat right beside me started wobbling and morphing into ridiculous shapes. A lamp in the corner bent down, did a full circle bending around and then sprung back. I have no explanation for why I thought this was so horrifying, except that I had no ground to actually stand on. No words of wisdom to fall back on came to my mind. I was completely alone, and everything seemed to actually become real manifesting out of my hallucinations somehow. Everything I saw felt wrong and evil, and somehow intent on harming me. A rocking chair in the corner began rocking violently, and a face formed on it that was laughing at me. And then, they were all laughing. As they laughed, they would point to me and look at each other. The face came right up to me from out of the rocking chair and passed through me as it laughed. I was utterly horrified and sweating profusely. Then I caught a glance of the large window and saw people reflected who weren't in the room. It seemed as if they were in a different room altogether, a room that was an exact mirror of the one I was in. They saw me see them, and then they came, zombie-eyed to the window, banging on the glass with their hands. They were all pale white and sickly looking, the typical undead stereotype, and they were passing through the glass onto my couch. My only saviour through this terror seemed to be light. 
I was too afraid to go over to the other side of the room and turn on the other lights, or leave the room and wander through the darkness of the house for that matter. So there I was, squatted and nauseated with fear, when the zombie things came towards me. But as they came into the light, they became transparent and dissolved into nothingness. I was there until the next day. I was still very much intoxicated as dawn broke, but the symbolism of it and my extreme tiredness somehow gave me the courage to go back to my room and sleep. If there's a lesson I learned, it would be to respect fear for what it is. I tried everything I could to make the experience positive, or at least neutral. When all else failed, I had to wait for sunrise and believe it would somehow release me from my fear, which fortunately for me, it did. Three thousand seven hundred and fifty to four thousand five hundred UG LSD nightmare trip report. First things first, as you can see by the title, this trip ended up being one of the most powerful I've ever been through, and I was in no condition to be taking acid at all, let alone such a massive amount. I was an idiot, learned from my mistakes. It was a little less than a year ago. A good friend and I had been tripping one to two times a month for about six months and had been slowly increasing the doses we had been taking. So by this time I had taken 1000 UG a few times and was extremely comfortable at this dose. I wanted a little more excitement for this particular night, so I got in touch with my source and arranged to pick up a higher dose. I met him around 5.30 in the afternoon after work, right at the beginning of a long weekend. He told me that he had a new batch of LSD that had just come in, and that it was super strong, so I went with that instead of the other acid I had been buying. What I didn't realise at the time was that this sheet of acid was between 250 to 300 UG per tab, so by failing to ask into this new batch further, I sealed my own fate. I took 15 tabs of this blotter all at once, around 6 o'clock with my buddy, who took 4 tabs to be safe and we decided to watch YouTube videos until we came up. What follows is a little foggy. All in all, I only remember a small portion of this trip. 6.30pm This is when the effects started to become very clear. My heart started pumping more, and I could feel the stuff climbing up my spine. At this stage, I also started getting afraid I would have a bad trip. I don't know why. The vibrations were pretty bad at this point already as well. 7pm. The first peak hits me. I was not ready for it to take hold so quickly. In the past, it had sometimes taken 90 minutes until I even started to notice the drug. I made it through this one okay by allowing YouTube to distract me. 9pm. The next wave hits me and just blows me the fuck away. I remember looking at the TV and seeing a flower bloom out from the screen towards my face. As it neared me, I noticed that there was a woman standing in front of it. Flabbergasted and completely unable to communicate, I stared at her face wide-eyed for a few seconds. She looked deep into my eyes and raised a finger to her lips, telling me to shh, before exploding into a kaleidoscope of colours that blanket the room. As I snap out of that, I am extremely confused and afraid. I yell out, What the fuck was that? And my friend started to freak out, I believe because we were seeing the same thing. He doesn't remember this portion of the trip at all. 9.40pm Since that last experience, we were both getting more and more worked up, feeding off of each other's wild energy until it literally became a screaming match. Both of us were now 100% convinced that the world was coming to an end right outside and that it was our fault for some reason. I make the biggest mistake of the whole night at this time. I break all the rules of tripping in one move. I walk outside by myself in my boxes, while on somewhere between 3,750 and 4,500 micrograms of LSD. At this point I am peaking extremely hard. I can't really see anything. On a dose as high as this, it's kind of like you lose your original five senses, and instead have a sixth sense that can perceive everything all at once. It's like every bit of sensory input comes at you on a single plane, if that makes sense. 
So it's 9.45pm now. Somehow I've made it across a busy street without getting hit by a car, and I've also managed to lose my boxers. That's right ladies and gentlemen, I'm now completely naked in public, and I don't know who I am, where I am, where I'm from, etc. And on top of all that, I can't see anything past the hallucinations at this point. So across this busy street I see a group of what may or may not be people, and since I'm completely petrified I go over to them to try and ask for some kind of help. As I get closer I start to hear yelling coming from the group and a large guy comes running up to me. I thought he was going to kill me, so I try to run but I end up stumbling into this dude's car and he socks me right in the side of the face. I decide that communicating isn't going to work with these people, so I stumble away, back in the direction of my apartment. 9.55pm As I'm trying to get away from the dude who hit me, I hear someone yelling for me to fucking stop. This obviously terrifies me, so I run for my life in the opposite direction, only to be stopped by three people with guns drawn and pointed at me. I didn't realise that these people were police at the time, but they sure as hell were. They tried to shout some commands at me, but I can't understand anything they're trying to tell me. I try to walk away and get hit with a taser. I watch the prongs float through the air at what seems to be about a hundredth of life's normal speed, and as soon as it hits my skin, I'm completely ripped from my body and I enter a completely infinite and black space. I'm floating through this space and I see a very small point of light, about the size of a distant star off in one direction. I decide to float in the direction of this light, and as I draw nearer I can make out colours coming from the light that I have never seen before. Not just shades of colours that I knew, but entirely new primary colours. I continue moving closer to the light, and I become aware of a very beautiful piece of music playing. It's a song I have never heard before in my life, but it feels so familiar to me it completely relaxes me. As I realise this, I also begin to feel that I have been to this place before. The limitless void of nothingness with this distant light felt more comfortable than my own bed. I bask for what feels like hours in the presence of the most comforting feeling I have ever experienced. Meanwhile as the light draws near, I realise that it's not a star, but it's actually a book. I approach this massive book which seems to be the only thing around me and flip through it. I don't actually reach out and touch it, but somehow using my mind I am able to turn the enormous and ancient feeling pages of this book. It appears to be alive. It looks like a massive tree began to grow out of the nothingness around here, and instead of leaves this book grew from its branches. The pages lay open in front of me. On the left page there is a blue energy emitting from within the book itself. The energy manifests as blue veins twisting and splitting, all pointed towards the spine of the book. On the opposite page there is a similar energy but in red instead of blue. The words duality, truth, and you shouldn't be seeing this right now floated through my mind. As I heard the last words, I snapped out of it. It felt like I'd literally existed as part of that black space for years, but as I came to, I was still in the middle of falling from being tased. So I hit the ground. I still have no fucking idea who I am or anything, but the police end up having to tase me two more times just to get me to stay on the ground. They then load me into an ambulance and I black out from there until I get to jail. This experience was by far the single most intense of my entire life. I just felt like sharing it here. I've come to accept it and I actually took a lot of good things away from that trip so I don't regret it, but would not advise you to take that much LSD in a bad mood or you will not be the same for a while, or even taking it in general. I hope that someone can learn from this experience and maybe keep from making the same mistakes. TLDR, I took between 3750 UG and 4500 UG of acid and lost my shit. Don't be an idiot like I was. I see the most vivid hallucinations. A benzidamine and caffeine trip report by Nico P01 from Erowid. Published on the 11th of November 2020. Zero hours in. A dose of 1000 milligrams. Two capsules chased with a red bull. Ten minutes. 
No bad taste or numbness in mouth or throat. Gel capsules are working as intended. 49 minutes. No effect so far. 50 minutes. I feel a slight warning that something is coming, but it seems like it's probably mostly just paranoia. 55 minutes. Feeling of an aura. I seem to waver and I have a heady feel like sativa. One hour and five minutes. Eyes are suddenly dry. Heady feeling has intensified and body is feeling slightly heavy. As I stood up, I instinctually went to unplug the wire to my headphones. Except I'm using my wireless ones. It's a hallucination. Ten minutes. Difficulty concentrating. One hour and thirty-five minutes. Objects seem to be wavering, wiggling or moving in my peripheral vision. I hear what sounds like music from the kitchen. My roommate must be back home, but when I go check, they're not there. No lights are on anywhere except my room. Starting to notice the classic emotional effects. Feelings of impending doom, anxiety, jumpy, fear, terror. Darkness intensifies all of the effects of delirians, making water trips a significant emotional challenge. 1 hour and 40 minutes. Emotional effects intensifying. Constant feeling of someone or something behind my back. Auditory hallucination of breathing behind me. 1 hour and 45 minutes. I look at the edge of my brown desk, behind which is a white wall. I see in my direct vision, i.e. looking directly at the hallucination, what looks like air turbulence if one could see such a thing. Tiny translucent ripples, whirlwinds and currents of air. They appear close to the edge of my desk, then disintegrate after several seconds into a cloud of transparent ghost-like ash. After a few minutes I see small translucent spiders going back and forth across the edge. If I look at one individual spider for long enough, it will disintegrate into the ash cloud. 1 hour 55 minutes. Massively difficult to concentrate or use words. Hands shaking slightly. Very, very heady feeling. Two hours. More transparent spiders on the edge of the desk. Like a busy street. Some of them are bigger now. When I look at a single spider, it starts to do weird things. Like attack other spiders or shapeshift into a tiny deer or house. Then disintegrating once again into an ash cloud. I stick my hand onto the edge of the desk and the spiders move over the top of my hand. Two hours and five minutes. Starting to see the first signs of the classic trails, streamers or streaks. If this is the main effect of a person taking Benzi wants to see they really shouldn't be taking Benzi. Two hours and ten minutes. Feeling sudden chills and also fearful of things behind my back. I put on my jacket. In my peripheral vision I start to see faces, heads and hands and inanimate objects and textures. Some of these objects seem to be moving like spirits. A pile of faux fur in the corner of my room suddenly feels more threatening than anything else I've seen so far and I don't know why. It appears as though feeling terror is not a choice during this trip, but something I must cope with instead. 2 hours and 20 minutes The hallucinated music from the kitchen now sounds like a podcast. My headphones are around my neck, playing music, but when I put them on my ears, nothing is actually playing. I feel physically exhausted by this point. No stimulant effects so far at all. The spiders on the edge of the desk are now crawling away from the edge towards the keyboard, but fade out before getting more than a couple inches. 
Two hours and 30 minutes. Spiders are now crawling over the top of the mouse when I'm not directly looking at it. In the room I now see black spiders in every dark corner, nook, etc, wherever there is a shadow. They start to seem more real. Two hours and 45 minutes. I've been feeling random itches, tingles and pinpricks for a while. But now I'm certain that I'm feeling tactile hallucinations. Three hours. A dark spirit appears in the corner of my room. I see what looks like a fuzzy black leg of a very large spider curl around the corner of my shelf. Then another, and now four. Then four more on the wall opposite. They're actually long, jagged fingers. I'm looking directly at the small spectre as their head slides into view. Their eyes are like two bright spots in the shadow-like circle that is their head. Then it opens its toothed mouth in a silent roar and rushes towards the centre of the room, but disappearing far before it reaches me. It appears that bright light keeps away the darker hallucinations, but enables the more bright transparent hallucinations to exist. 3 hours and 5 minutes I feel what seems like tiny spider legs crawling across my bare hands and socked feet, but nothing is visible. 3 hours and 35 minutes I'm starting to sober up. All effects are fading. 3 hours and 50 minutes Feeling 90% sober as well as feeling more energetic. 4 hours I take a dose of 700 milligrams. One capsule chased with a Red Bull. At 4 hour and 10 minutes at this point I am unable to distinguish between paranoid thoughts and actual hallucinations in my peripheral vision. 4 hours and 20 minutes I feel extremely dehydrated. The room seems darker than usual and I am feeling very warm suddenly. 4 hours and 25 minutes Head and body heaviness are slowly returning. 4 hours and 40 minutes the hallucination of the headphone wire to my wireless headphones twitches in my peripheral vision again. 4 hours and 45 minutes. This last capsule had a small tear, resulting in a small amount of benzene spilled out while swallowing. I know what people mean about the awful taste, also the back of my mouth and throat feel numb. 5 hours and 10 minutes. More auditory hallucinations. I'm now hearing conversations in the kitchen and whispering voices from the opposite corner of my room. The whispers seem to move like an invisible auditory cloud towards the kitchen. I feel as if the voice cloud brushes by my legs by mere inches. I notice I have to turn the volume up on my headphones by a lot to hear it. We'll regret that later. 5 hours and 15 minutes, feeling significant time dilation, as well as painful pinpricks all over. I can't tell if I'm just extremely dehydrated or if my numb throat is just making it difficult to swallow. Probably both. I feel dizzy, and I notice much more vibrant trails. 7 hours and 30 minutes, much the same effects as the first dose up until now. I went to use the washroom and heard a swarm of bees buzzing inside the ceiling fan. 8 hours. I'm getting physically exhausted by this point, almost blacked out. Not sure if the cause is lack of sleep, I'm starting to trip at bedtime. It's, maybe it's post adrenaline fatigue or high dosage. 8 hours and 30 minutes. Reach the peak. I see the most vivid hallucinations. Animals, spirits, lots and lots and lots of spiders everywhere. In every dark spot of the room, every shadow cast by my blanket, by clothes on the floor, inside pockets of my clothes, everywhere. When I look at a single spider, it shapeshifts into a small rodent, then a cockroach, then a snake, then a lizard, then some other strange creature, without end. 
The spiders are now on my body, though only two to three at a time. Feet, legs, chest, arms, back, neck, ears, head, everywhere. I feel tingles, pinpricks, and the occasional jabbing pain all over my body, all hallucinated. I look into the darkest corner of the room and see a very large spider with army of tiny spiders on her back, likely hundreds, that peek out from the corner and walk towards me, and a feeling as though it is coming directly for me occurs. However, it turns back around after walking a couple feet and disappears into the shadows. 8 hours and 35 minutes. Come down is taking much longer, and I'm still having episodes of vibrant hallucination and emotional effects. They come and then subside like waves. 8 hours and 45 minutes. I've been listening to music from the start up until now, but I had to turn it off. Listening to music makes me feel more exhausted, like I can physically feel the effort required to hear and understand the music. 9 hours and 15 minutes. The lights brighten suddenly, a couple times, which is either hallucination or pupil dilation. Other hallucinations and effects are still going on though, although they are less vivid. I hear the sudden return of a music or podcast in the kitchen. 10 hours and 15 minutes. I went to get more water and saw a shockingly vivid hallucination in my peripheral vision of an adult person who looked like a cross between the Ring Girl and the Heath Ledger Joker. They were following me and peeking around the corners. They would disappear when I looked right at the corner, then poke their head, feet and body out a few seconds after looking away. Had to keep them behind me to not see them. 10 hours and 30 minutes. I'm no longer feeling any physical hallucination. I feel very strong malaise, like a flu and also have a migraine, including a sensitivity to noise and bright light. I'm literally ready to fall asleep at any second, but I hear and feel bugs crawling into my ear when I try to close my eyes for too long. 11 hours. Hallucinations are subsiding. I am able to change clothes and close my eyes without too much issue. 15 hours in. I kept jumping awake every 10 minutes like I was falling or something touched me or a loud noise. All hallucinations. I have only felt this fatigued a few times in my life. In the end I am only able to get one hour sleep and then two consecutive hours sleep after waking up every 10 minutes for a while. I feel lingering tingles and spiders, especially on my bare feet, as well as lingering emotional effects. Trails are very vivid, but they look different now than any other time. They appear as outlines of any bright light source after moving my eyes, like a ghost image or outline. My eyes feel really sore and swollen. The shape-shifting snake or cockroach in the darkness corner of my room, which has been there since not long after my second dose, is still there, I think, but I'm not sure as I'm having trouble focusing eyes on any dark spots in the room. I feel very dehydrated, but less so than before. Coconut water helped a lot. I was getting overhydrated. I can't remember how much water I drank in the last 11 hours, Possibly 6 litres. Feeling less flu sick by this point, but more mild hangover sick. 15 hours and 40 minutes. Time dilation is gone for sure now. I can't tell if the cockroach is still there in the dark corner or if it's just a vision memory. I still can't focus on small dark things in my room. I have very faint breathing in the corner of my room. I'm still getting the occasional tingle. I don't see any trails at all, even when dimming the lights, but emotional effects increase when doing so. I'm tired but not nearly as exhausted as before. 
15 hours and 45 minutes. I hear distant talking in the corner of my room, but only for 5 seconds. 16 hours and 30 minutes. I'm still feeling residual emotional effects and the occasional tingle or pinprick. I'm feeling vertigo and malaise. Definitely not sober. 17 hours and 30 minutes. Feeling mostly sober now. Sudden rush of energy. The trip is over. After reviewing and editing my notes, I now know that I remembered everything in perfect clarity. This trip went pretty much exactly as I expected from my research, aside from the duration not being related linearly with dosage. Conclusion Benzidamine is not a recreational drug. Being delirious is not fun. I did not enjoy my trip. I cannot possibly fully describe all of the terrifying things I saw during my trip, but I will remember it all forever. A 1000 milligram MDMA trip report, sent in by Cole. I've just watched your video about you sharing your experience tripping on MDMA slash MDA, and until now, I thought I was the only one who had experienced such a thing. Your video prompted my research into why it happens, and also inspired me to share my trip report with you. So here goes. Me and my friend got hold of some 350 milligram MDMA ecstasy tablets, Reapers. These are some of the strongest pingers I have ever come across, and they really pack a punch. So, me and my friend decided we would venture into our city, Birmingham, which is one train ride away from where we live, and spend the evening getting pinged just for the sake of it really. At this point, I'm at the beginning of my rave phase, and have taken pingers about five times on separate occasions before this night. Once we arrived in Birmingham, we headed straight for the Weatherspoons, where I dropped a full pill, and she dropped half. The following two hours were pretty standard, and nothing extraordinary happened, so I'll skip to the good part. Once I start to come down, I'm thinking to myself that I'm nowhere near ready to go home yet, so I have the wise idea of dropping two more. So at this point, 1000 milligrams of MDMA has been consumed, but the first pill had pretty much worn off, so I wouldn't consider it a full 1000 milligram dose. I'm really starting to feel the come up at this point, and my eyes just can't stop darting around. My body is rushing and my emotions are flying high. We decide to sit down on a bench outside Tesco car park. The road in front of us consisted of small, seven foot trees planted at regular intervals between the two lanes. One of these trees, however, was broken and lying slightly on its side. It was at this point when my visuals began. I stare at this tree to see it suddenly stand up and raise its pincers in the air. You're probably thinking, what fucking pincers? It's a tree, you knob. But I assure you, this tree completely transformed into a lobster right before my eyes. I'm in pure shock and confusion at this seven foot lobster, which is just standing there waving its pincers and moving left and right and vertically, as if it's doing some sort of Hawaiian dance. I ask my friend what the fuck is going on over there, and she tells me that it's just a tree. I look away to see if anything else is changing forms, but nothing. Only this one specific tree had taken on another form, and everything else was completely normal. When I look back, now the lobster is even more detailed. I can see eyes and a face, and it begins to move towards me. At this point, we decide to get up and go into the Tesco car park, which was lit up with lights since it's night time at this point. We sat down against the wall, and I realise how totally fucked I am. Everything is unreal, and I'm seeing heads peek over the tops of all the parked cars, and then dipping back down immediately, almost like a game of whack-a-mole. This proceeded for another 20 minutes until I decided to get an Uber home and go to bed. In bed is when I fully peaked, and my hallucinations really took off. I lay with my eyes closed, only to be greeted with a wave of sounds in my ears. I can hear voices, some familiar and some not. I heard the sounds of the city. Car alarms, my mother shouting my name, 
and a whole range of other things of which I cannot recall. I remember laying there and thinking how truly amazing it is that my brain was able to conjure up such original sounds, and I wasn't really in fear either. However, the sounds were so overwhelming that I had to open my eyes to give my brain another sense to fuck with. So I do exactly that, and when I open my eyes and look at my ceiling, what I saw will stick with me forever. Demon faces would appear out of the dark and come flying inches away from my face, sort of how Voldemort is portrayed when he apparates. These demons are whizzing around my room, and I can hear them screaming and shouting hellish cries. I look at my desk, and the lobster returns, a repeating hallucination on MDMA for me. I was happy to see the lobster, and when I tried to get closer to it, it suddenly turned into a six foot Chinese dragon and started circling my bed. I saw the fire it was breathing, and the scales on its body. Its tongue drooped out of its mouth as it performed the show for me, flying around my room in the most interesting patterns I have seen. This experience was something brand new to me, since I would only taken acid once before this, and only experienced melting and kaleidoscopic effects, as opposed to seeing creatures and beings in my room like I did on MDMA. Somehow, I was able to find my way to sleep during this time, and so the experience was over. What inspired me to send you this was watching your personal MDMA trip report, and I was in pure shock at the similarities, not only between our trips, but the story itself. I was in sixth form at the time going for an identical phase as you, raving and pinging almost every weekend, Lamau. This is the first time I've actually heard someone have visuals like me on MDMA. I always ask people at raves, and it seems it's very rare for one to have such a trip like ours on MD. I hope you found this story interesting, and I apologise for my lack of writing techniques. Thanks. Happy tripping. Cole. Ninety-five milligrams intramuscular for the evil wizard. A five MEO DMT trip report by Evil Wizard, uploaded to Earwood.org, April twentieth, twenty fourteen. I've been refining DMT for years, but only once did I actually get high smoking it. I had to vaporise a gram or so. Smoking 5-MeO DMT never got me anywhere, vaporising up to 60 milligrams over an evening. Acid was a gateway drug. I've done my acid, done the 2Cs, 4-ACO DMT, did 80 milligram once, 4-HOMET, and a dozen other popular research chemicals. I've handled myself well over the past 20 years. I know the line between use and abuse, and I am respected in my scene as a trusted name in drugs. My girl and I had IM'd NNDMT before, one milligram over a kilogram each, so I got 95 milligrams and she got 45 milligrams. I had a pleasant time with entities wheeling machinery into the room and showing me things. I could still walk around and recognise the apartment, there were just other entities there as well. I did a nitrous balloon and zoomed into the micro level where the animistic spirits in the walls and ceiling became evident. Crowds of elves were walking by and wondering where I'd come from and what I was doing with that balloon. I was like, don't judge me bro. She wound up going down a wormhole and getting tortured for her past life indiscretions. It lasted about 30 minutes with no real hangover. So we aren't nearly enough research. We IM'd the same amounts of 5-MeO DMT, reasoning it would not be as strong by weight. Eerowid note. The dose described in this report is very high, potentially beyond Eerowid's heavy range, and could pose serious health risks or result in unwanted extreme effect. Sometimes extremely high doses reported errors, rather than actual doses used. Yep, I IM'd 95mg of 5-MeO DMT. We did this in my apartment above the funeral home I work at. Yes, there were bodies downstairs. Within minutes the power came on me in waves. I would be pushed out of my body, then return for a deep breath. I was slumping on the couch with no muscle control, lolling and grinning. It came in waves, where we would be forced from our bodies while nodding off like on a GHB high, where you just black out for a second and then jerk back awake. I kept repeating, just remember to breathe. I was uncertain that I would live, and felt that I was blacking out from blood loss. Reality was quivering, and the visuals were blowing my mind. Shit was going on heavily. 
ghost stood around, pantomiming the needle injection and suggesting tourniquets. I thought there were paramedics who were finding my body and was wondering why they weren't helping. I could hear them calling my name. I have haemophilia, a clotting disorder, and thought that I was bleeding from needle holes. I resigned myself to my mistake and my death, and I simply let go. I then found myself in a green field that went on forever, filled with some of those self-dribbling elf balls. They were each humming their own little tone, and they were all connected to each other. They were very comforting. It was so nice. Like being cuddled by bunnies. Totally reassuring and peaceful. My identity, or ego, was less than it was before. I felt that these were the Elysian fields out of Greek mythology. Gradually, I connected with each elf or soul. I felt that these were souls that had completed their karmic turns. As they each turned their attention to me, I saw a golden spiral, like a pie chart. I contemplated life's big mysteries, and as I solved each one, the chart filled in. I could hear them discussing my progress and supporting me. After the last mystery was solved, the spiral became a circle. The entire universe and everyone in it resolved into a single thing, and I felt the truth that we are all one. The circle, or universe, hummed a tone, and I hummed with it. This felt like the near-death experiences I read about where you are greeted by an all-encompassing light, or Jesus, or whatever. The elves seemed really impressed I had managed to get here, and I figured this out without dying. They cheered and gave me a slow clap. I knew that I would live, and could return here any time. I came out of the deep delirium and was still on the couch. There were still ghosts about and spirals and vortices spinning in the air. I could tell I was back in the funeral home, but the visuals were astounding. I looked at my girl, and she was seized up, twisted to one side, but limp in the body. I was too messed up to take a pulse, but she looked dead. I could not see her soul inside her body, so I shook her and freaked out, looking for some way to save her, a tourniquet or something. I felt like a failure. My anatomical training was for naught. I had killed my friend and lover. A previous girlfriend had OD'd on an opiate injection while away on a trip, and my life and career were over. I was clearly a degenerate weirdo who had killed someone with my fascination with psychedelics, despite my expertise. I tried mouth to mouth, but her muscle tension was too great. I wrapped a plastic spine and skull around my bicep, Halloween beer bong, thinking that this counted at least for style points and went racing down the stairs, pantless. I opened the door and urged the paramedics inside, but they were just ghosts. So 60 minutes after injecting, I ran outside, into the funeral home parking lot. I retained enough sense of irony to realise it looked like a drug freak out. I was still blessed out and in love with life, and thought I could crawl into bed with my neighbour or employer and he would help me save the girl's life. I tried entering the garage of the funeral home, but it was locked. The cars on the street seemed menacing, so I stood in the middle of the parking lot for a moment. The evil wizard, pantless in the summer night, spine as a tourniquet, all doors closed to me after I'd just solved the mystery of life. I went inside and called 911 and asked for medical attention. I told them we had done way too much DMT. They kept asking questions, but I left the phone to go check my notes for the coroner that I make before dosing something weird. My girl walks out of the bathroom, alive and very pissed. I am happy to see her alive, and I calm down. However, at this point, we are both convinced that we have brain damage. We are sitting on the carpet and the visuals are going wild. In this moment, I am totally zen, ready for paramedics to come and pull us out of there. Any repercussions are irrelevant. I am existentially wiped out after all this. Nothing matters right now except her. Staying with her in our future as burnt out junkie fashionistas. Perhaps I can keep working funerals as the town idiot. I realise I will likely face criminal charges for the substances involved, but que sera sera. 911 calls back, and she realises the cops are coming. Fortunately, she goes into emergency mode and harasses me into leaving, so they don't enter the apartment. I drop the lights, put on pants, shoes, hat, grab my ID and keys, still talking to ghosts as well, and lock up the apartment and car. 
I confront the weirded out paramedics on the sidewalk, tell them I'm having a panic attack and maybe an allergic reaction to my legit meds. They coerce me into the ambulance and to the hospital. I'm coming down throughout all this and talking sense, although my pupils are still saucers and my heart rate is 160. My blood pressure is also massive and my CO2 counts are high. They took all sorts of readings. I walked home two hours after injecting. She was waiting for me outside the apartment and did not hate me anymore. I realised that we had pulled through this massive ordeal. We took some Valium and slept. I worked a half day and my boss was totally unaware of the situation. My nerves were shot but I felt so grateful that we were alive. My body felt great as well. I had left it and when I returned it felt slightly different. My sexual excitement was heightened. My appetite for food, music and sex all amplified. I felt great and I wanted to go back into that space. I really did and still do. But I'll be playing with small doses, combined with NNDMT perhaps, and potentiating them with dissociatives like free MEO, PCP and nitrous from now on. I felt that NNDMT was more about the entities and 5-MeO was more about the self. I like to make the comparison that NN is the grace and 5-MeO is the power. That fits. I really should have had a babysitter. I risked our lives and careers and freedom for this. Although, I think a babysitter would have freaked out seeing us convulsing, unresponsive and not breathing. If I had a ventilator and something to calm my heart, I would do a dose almost as large at some point in my life. I'd do it somewhere safe, fully clothed, with a sitter and away from my domicile. As near death experiences go, this beats the car crashes or illnesses I've experienced. I'm a mortician because I feel that death is life's greatest mystery and I'm trying to get close to death to understand life in the universe. Now I know that solving the secret of life is as simple as dying. All matter and all beings are one eternal thing. Screw synthetic marijuana. First time heavier hallucinations than any other substance I've ever encountered. It has been about nine years since this trip, but I remember it as clearly as if it had happened last night. It was the first and only time I have ever experienced full open eye visuals that had little to no relevance to the world around me. I believe it was a JWH derivative, but I can't be certain. It was a relaxed setting for the trip, Three buddies and I were out in the woods at night behind a house one of them lived at, sitting on some of those reclining pool chairs. I was young and dumb, smoking out of a bent-in monster energy can. I didn't feel anything for the first four hits, so I stupidly kept taking bigger and bigger hits each time. It wasn't until my friend passed me the can to take a fifth hit that shit hit the fan for real. In a blink of an eye, Everything in the world faded to black except for him. He stood up and slowly started to turn green and bulk up like the Hulk, but once he hit full size, blood started to flow from every part of his body. It was coming out of sweat, streaming out of his eyes, openly flowing from his nose, mouth and ears until he was nothing but blood. As fast as this hallucination started, it ended and he was back to sitting beside me trying to pass me the can. So I took the can and had another hit, probably because I have a big dick. I went to pass it to my friend on my left when the same fade to black thing started to happen. I watched him stand and proceed to laugh the most evil and cynical laugh I've ever heard. Slowly, I watched as his skin started to turn colours and break open rotting on his bones till it started to fall to the earth. His flesh sunk into the soil, where a tree started to grow at an extremely fast rate. When it was done, it was a 25 foot tall weeping willow. It was about this time that the fog started to roll in behind him and the tree with gravestones appearing in the distance. He gave me one last laugh, then proceeded to rip off his appendages one by one hanging them on nooses created by rope-like limbs of the tree beside him. Much like before, 
As fast as it started, it had ended, and I was back to sitting with my friends, with my buddy on my left asking why I wouldn't let go of the can. Apparently he had been trying to take it while I was in this hellish trip. Around this time I told everyone that I felt the need to go back inside, mainly because fuck mosquitoes and uncomfortable chairs. I stood up to lead the pack back to the house, but all the blood rushed from my head and created another hallucination. I was in a trench surrounded by dead bodies. I looked up over the edge to see barbed wire and an open field beyond, with people shooting from an opposing trench. At that time, a man who appeared to be of Asian heritage came running across no man's land. He took a knee and promptly shot me in the head, which caused me to fall backwards. Back to reality, I'm lying in the pool chair again, with my friends asking if I'm alright, because I'd just stood up and collapsed back down. I told them I was fine, but still wanted to go inside. I blinked and they were all gone. They had left me deep within the forest by myself. I started to hear things all around me, see things ducking into their shadows every time I tried to get a good look at them. I pulled out my knife about the same time I saw what was making these noises. They were tribal pygmy people, about a foot tall brandishing small knives and spears, obviously on the hunt. This is the only point I do not fully remember. I somehow made it out of the forest. The day after this we went and looked and I had apparently hacked away at several small trees with a dull butterfly knife. But back to that night, I had made it through the forest but there was still a pool in between me and the house. Don't ask me why but my only idea as to how to pass it was to walk out onto the diving board and slowly try to walk across the water like Jesus. After about 5 minutes of doing this I finally realised I could just walk around the pool. So I entered the house to see my friends watching Rocky Horror Picture Show, which I had never seen before. I came to the conclusion that I was just hallucinating about transvestite vampires for some reason. I decided to lie down on the bottom bunk of my friend's bunk bed. I got really comfortable at first, but then decided that I wanted to talk to my friends, so I attempted to sit up. As much as I tried this, I couldn't seem to sit up whatsoever. In a split second, I found myself looking down at my body from the top corner of the room. I thought, well, at least I can see why I can't sit up. I tried with all my might to control my body, considering I wasn't currently in it at the moment. I saw my back lift off of the bed about an inch, but there seemed to be some sort of muscle connecting my back to the bed. I sat up with more and more force, stretching and eventually ripping the muscle. Blood started to flow onto the bed and shoot across the walls, making all my friends stand and start screaming. My friend's mum runs in hearing them and starts screaming herself. She pulls out her phone and starts to talk to a police dispatcher asking for an ambulance. At this time I popped back into my body, fully sitting up, but my friends were back to sitting down as calm as can be, watching the television. No blood, no screaming. No panicking mothers calling 911. I sat and looked at my friends for a few moments, taking in that everything I had witnessed was a hallucination. Then I saw that none of them had any joints in their bodies. There was literally a three inch gap where there should have been their necks, elbows, wrists, hips, etc. With five strings coming up from them as if they were puppets. I looked up to see that the ceiling was gone, and instead, there was a giant white hand with a string connected to every finger for each person. Once the hands realised that I could see them, they released the strings and vanished. In doing so, my friends fell to heaps on the ground. Slowly, these strings started to move on their own accord, forming into a web on the opposing wall from me. The fallen bodies of my friends started to shake, then bolted up to their hands and feet with their backs to the ground, but with their heads turned 180 degrees to where they could look at me correctly. They then started to crawl upon the web made by the strings like spiders, whilst all staring at me. And then, back to reality. They are all sitting exactly as they were, still steadily watching TV. 
At this time I feel that I've become extremely nauseous, so I run outside and puked. I walk back inside and get some water, and then went and laid back down and fell asleep. This concludes my first and only fully fledged trip. Shadow People, a DPT trip report, posted by Morning Glory Sea to Irwid.org, April 18th, 2003. October 2001, 30 milligrams of DPT. I carefully weighed out 100 milligrams of NN dipropyl tryptamine hydrochloride and dissolved it in 2 milliliters of distilled water. It was very difficult to get the DPT to dissolve, and I found it necessary to add a little heat to get into the solution. I then filtered the liquid through a 0.02 micron filter for sterility. After transferring the solution to a sealed glass ampoule for storage, I measured out 0.6 milliliters of this solution, which of course, was equivalent to 30 milligrams of DPT. This was my first experience with intramuscularly administered DPT, and I rightfully decided to start with what I viewed as a low dose. I was never one to enjoy snorting odd smelling powders. I was anxious to try DPT via a new method of administration. Though I was a bit nervous about the injection process, I was looking very forward to comparing the effects of IMing this material to insufflating it. Those I've spoken with who have taken it both ways swear by the intramuscular method. Plus, DPT was always administered by IM injection when it was initially researched as a psychotherapeutic tool in the 70s, so it seems to be a well explored manner of administration. Using my trusty automatic injecting device, I administered the 30 milligrams into my upper thigh. There was no burn and the injection went smoothly. No immediate effects were noted. I decided to spend the onset of the experiment outside, so I packed myself a bowl of marijuana and brought one balloon of nitrous oxide with me and made my way outdoors. For an evening in October in the Midwest, it was unusually warm. There was not a cloud in the sky and also very little humidity. After 10 minutes, there still was nothing happening, so I decided to smoke some pot figuring it would help kick in the effects. Two or three hits was all it took. After the marijuana was consumed, I noted the distinct DPT vibration in my body. The night sky was suddenly filled with colours, and there seemed to be life and activity stirring about in the trees. I was amazed at the relative smoothness of IMDPT. Previous experiments of insufflated DPT were very forceful and demanding in nature. In some ways this was actually gentle, or at least during the onset of the experience it was. Around 15 minutes into the experiment, the effects seemed well developed, and I decided to take my balloon of nitrous oxide. As usual, the effects were overwhelming. I can only describe the place I travelled to as serene. There was complete silence as the universe and I became one. My ego ceased to exist, and the I simply became one with everything. True bliss and universal harmony. This lasted about three minutes, though I had no perception of time as this event occurred. It was on my return that things got a little weird. As soon as I became aware of my body again, I noted a strangeness in the air. I couldn't quite place my finger on what it was that was so weird but there was a certain foreboding feeling in the air, almost as though I was no longer alone. I decided to gather my things and make my way back inside. The walk down to my room was a little difficult. My motor control was a little off and I seemed to sway as I walked. The visuals had also grown quite intense and it was actually a little difficult to see clearly over the intense trails and colours that filled my perceptual field in the dim light I was walking through. I put on Donovan's Please Don't Bend, which is a very beautiful acoustic ballad that has a biting edge to it. Very intense song. What happened next is beyond my ability to describe rationally. It's definitely the sort of event that is completely unbelievable unless you experience it firsthand. As soon as I sat down on my couch, there was this creature, this entity or being that was there with me. It sat directly behind me on the couch and started to massage my scalp. 
It was shaped in a humanoid fashion. I could not make out any specific features because I did not turn around and examine it. I was paralysed with fear, and I did not attempt to intervene or stop it from happening at all. I just sat there and let it do what it wanted to do. I'm not in a position to say any of this was a figment of my mind. Not only could I clearly detect the presence of someone or something there with me, but I could also feel these hands in my hair, and my hair was also visibly moving. There was certainly no wind or breeze in my bedroom moving my hair in the fashion it was. The entity event seemed to end as soon as it began. This occurrence was over by the time the song had ended. The experience of having my scalp moved by a presence I was not used to had left me rather unnerved, and I spent the remainder of the trip attempting to put the pieces back together and figure out just what had happened. For the next hour or so, I rode out the waves of fear and uncertainty that I was feeling, knowing the effects of the DPT would soon wane. Though I never reached a state of all-out panic, it was not a comfortable trip after this event. I did not expect to have entity contact from a mere 30 milligrams of DPT, and I suppose I was in a bit of a shock from the whole thing. By the third hour, I was mostly down. It was just my body that was still buzzing. A few days later, I visited my local wise lady, who was a Native American, and she seemed to know exactly what it was. It's a shadow person, she said while laughing. That's what they do, among other things. They massage the scalp. They mean you no harm. My friend was really convinced that's where it was, and said my description of what happened fitted the bill completely. She has had three such encounters herself after deep meditation, and says many Native American legends speak of beings that she feels are what we both have encountered. She did not know exactly what shadow people were or where they came from, but did offer a few theories. The most reasonable of which I thought was shadow people exist to comfort us. They touch us to provide us their means of bringing soothing feelings. I guess that is what it was, and with that, I am satisfied. That trip will have to go down in my books as one of the strangest events I have experienced. I've had entity contact from smoke DMT, but nothing like this. Not direct physical contact. I also believe that the DPT may have been a catalyst in this event, but it was not the cause. Though I cannot even begin to decipher the meaning of it all, hopefully in the future, this mystery will reveal itself to me, and I can bring real meaning to it. Consequence of Ignorance A Detura Trip Report by Shigadi Schlade Posted to Irwid.org March 13th, 2010 Before I begin the actual story of the trip, I'd like to give you, the reader, a look at what happened leading up to the time of ingestion. It won't take long, but it gives you a better understanding of how my entire personality had changed due to the ingestion of the drug. I was at my cousin's house with a friend. For now, we'll call my cousin Mark and the friend Mo. We showed up at Mark's house at about 9. I met Mo there and we ended up taking turns at playing SOCOM in the living room, ripping on each other for no apparent reason, and eating what was left of the food in the house. Me and Mo went into the bedroom, because there was cable in there and he wanted to ask me something in particular. He asked me if I wanted to get messed up. I was always down, but we had to walk somewhere to get them. We then walked out, rode our bikes down to Main Street and picked a few seed pods of something we had no idea the origin of. We headed back to the house, and throwing caution to the wind, I took two pods full of seeds with a glass of water. Him being much smaller and never having any experience with any kind of drugs, I only took one. Mo weighs only about 140 pounds. It only seemed right that he took a smaller dose than I. I then laid down on the bed and stared up at the spinning ceiling fan. From this point on, I'm going to tell you what I remember, and what witnesses told me had happened. About 20 minutes after ingestion, I started feeling strange. I felt good though. I thought it was similar to the effects of smoking marijuana, but it really wasn't. The only similarity between the two is all of the sudden I had bad cotton mouth. 
I got a glass of water and went outside to check if my uncle had any snuff in the truck. He did, and I put in a pinch of Copenhagen. At this point, I felt very odd. I was stumbling around and slurring my words, sweating more than usual for the current temperature. I couldn't handle the small chew I had, and started to gag because of the extreme lack of moisture in my mouth. I took it out, stumbled back into the house and grabbed another glass of water. Went back into the bedroom and lay down on the bed, watching the ceiling fan once again. All of a sudden, a hazy purple spot started appearing on the ceiling. I was intrigued by this, so I stayed and watched them for a while. Time after ingestion, roughly one hour. Mo entered the room and asked if it was okay to turn the lights off. I had my fill of the purple haze, so I agreed to the blackout. I closed my eyes and it was like a laser show. Images of random objects drifted in and out of sight, while circular designs danced in the background. From here on, what I remember will be in quotes, and what happened that I have no recollection of will be in stars. The following will be in chronological order to the best of my abilities. At this point, I was drenched in sweat, so I was inclined to take off my shirt. I then went to the bathroom to splash water on my face, and ended up completely undressing. I had no idea where Mo was, nor what he was doing. I was naked in the bathroom, and I started throwing punches. Hard punches. I was boxing anything in the bathroom that wasn't bottled down. According to Mark, my uncle was awoken by the noise and got up to check. All of a sudden, I was shirtless in the living room, sitting on the couch looking up at Mark and my parents. I was disoriented, not sure of where I was at all. All I did was what my parents asked me to, which was put on my shoes and shirt and get in the car. I got up to walk out the door. I was driven back to my house in the country. I'm not sure what words were exchanged between me, my mother and my father, but I doubt there were any at all. I came to on another couch mine, looking up at my father, who didn't look particularly disappointed, but more amused at my odd and silly behaviour. I kept on having this sudden urge to get up, yet every time I attempted to, my father's stern voice chimed in saying, stay down, don't get up. I kept trying and he started to laugh as every time I got up, I'd sheepishly sit down. I felt like I was nine years old, doing as I was told or I'd be sent to my room, or worse, the corner. After many attempts, I thought I'd go at it at a different angle. I have to pee, I said. He looked at me with a warm smile and took my hand and helped me to the bathroom. I felt secure for some reason. I wasn't able to stand, so as I sat, my dad snickered in the doorway. I looked up at him again, wondering why I kept feeling younger and more helpless as the time passed. I can't go. Stop laughing, I said. He then helped me up and put me back on the couch. I sat and strained my ears to hear the conversation that went on between him and my mother in the other room. I kept hearing horrifying words like die and hospital and overdose. It's important to note at this point that in the crazy religion my family is part of, we don't go to the doctors whatsoever. They believe in healing through prayer. So if there was talk of a hospital visit, something bad was happening. I remember my father coming back in from the kitchen and taking my hand. I blacked out once again. I was rushed to the neighbouring town's hospital. Most parents did the same and we arrived at around the same time. I was rushed in and had an IV stuck in me. Well, they tried to stick me anyways. After the fifth attempt, the floor was spotted with blood and had something being pumped through my veins. I was being extremely violent. At one point, I even punched the doctor in the face and broke his glasses. This is when they decided that it would be best for me and other people's safety if I was restrained. I was tied to a bed and force-fed charcoal. It was not an easy task, but after about an hour, they had it done. I was given a new IV with some other kind of medical bullshit in it to calm me down. With my face, chest and neck covered in black coal residue, I finally found sleep. I came to with people surrounding me. It was a new day and peculiar things were happening. My grandmother, who does not smoke, was holding a lit cigarette. I had my sister lean down to ask her if she was smoking. She responded with a simple, No jackass, grandma doesn't smoke. 
I looked around the room to see where I was and why I was tied down. A white board on the opposite wall read, You're in the hospital. You're okay. It's the current date and no one is going to hurt you. The nurse apparently did this because during my blackouts, I was violent, quixotic and angry. I looked around the room for some familiar faces and found some. My whole family was there. While restrained, I was able to look under my blanket. I was fully naked and there was a tube coming out of my penis. I found this odd because I'd never been to a hospital and had no idea what a catheter even was. I looked up at my IV bag and it was an ear of corn. It started growing features and it soon became an ear of corn with a face. My father then asked what I was looking at and I turned to address him confidently. Cornhead, I said with a very serious look. I looked around the room at all the odd things happening around me. A money clip with a ten dollar bill in it was laying next to a small fish on the ceiling. I thought this was amazing, so I had to tell the nearest person about it. Once again, this is my sister. She looked up like the dumbass she is and said there was nothing there. I asked my mother if this sexy bondage was really necessary. She laughed and untied my hands. My feet were still restrained though at this point. All of a sudden, the room fell away around me and I was once again back at Mark's house. I had a PS2 controller in my hand playing Socom. Five minutes of playing had passed and the controller melted into a soft cotton material. I kept on apologising to Mark saying I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, over and over again. I opened my eyes and I was back in the hospital. The controller was now a blanket, which I was clutching very tightly in my hands. I felt scared and vulnerable and began to weep. Everyone that was close to me came and bid their well wishes. They chatted with me and I tried to chat with the nonsense coming out of my mouth and promptly left. I came to and it was dusk. My sister approached me and gave me a hug, took my shoes off of me. She had to lift the blanket a bit to get them and I thought she was going to expose my naked body to the few people still in the hospital room. No, don't look under there. They took my clothes and stuffed me in a dark tube, I said. She had a laugh and said she had to go and did just that. It was dark again now. I drifted in and out of consciousness for the better part of an hour. My aunt was at my bedside and all of a sudden, large centipedes and bugs started coming out of her ears. I was distraught, so I turned my attention to anything but her. The bugs had now filled the room and were crawling over everything. I screamed for help and my mother came to comfort me. She embraced me and told me to close my eyes. I cried hard. Then I slept. I woke up a bit later. No more than half an hour had actually passed. And then something caught my eye. A naked woman outside my window, dancing. She was beautiful. I remember telling myself, as soon as my mum's asleep, I'm going out there and fucking the shit out of her regardless of this catheter. And I passed out before she did, and now I realise it was obviously a hallucination. I awoke the next day to more well wishes. Then there was Boxy. Boxy was a gnome about the size of my thumb. He'd climbed down from the curtain around my bed and posted up on my shoulder. He reminded me of the Travelocity gnome. I was captivated. I had the most excited look on my face as he smiled at me. Then he winked and mouthed, Watch this! And then started to jump up and down on my shoulder. I was overjoyed and started chanting, Jump, Boxy, jump! to the enjoyment of my current audience. I was out of it. I said things to my family that I'm not proud of. I told my grandmother to eat a dick. I told my aunt she needed to get fucked hard. And I called my other grandmother a whore. I then went out of it again. The walls melted away and I was in my room holding my guitar. I started playing and once again, it melted into a blanket. I was angry. I threw a fit. Kept repeating, fuck, fuck, what the fuck? More well wishes came, more cards and more bullshit. I came to and it was night. I looked to the window and the woman was gone. 
In her place was a large man in a long trench coat and fedora. He looked at me and pulled out an old 50s Thompson. He began firing through the window and I lost it. I hysterically started crying, but again, my mother was there to comfort me. I fell asleep in her embrace. I awoke the next day and felt normal again. No hallucinations, no mad psychobabble, just normality. The nurse came in and deflated the balloon in my catheter and pulled it out, which hurt like a motherfucker. I was able to clothe myself, get up and walk to the bathroom and take a shit. I looked in the mirror and had black all over me. It was like I was the first one to pass out at a party and someone had found a sharpie. I met Mo at the facility shower and he looked like hell. He then told me all the bad things that he saw on his trip. At one point, he awoke to his room full of dead bodies, hanging on nooses from his ceiling. I felt bad for him. I felt bad for both of us. We had taken Datura, or Jimson weed, without researching it first and paid dearly for it. I'd lost three days of my fall break and hours of my life that I have no recollection of. The reason I was in the hospital for so long is because my heart almost exploded because of how high its heart rate was. I hope that by writing this, that I've helped inform you in some way. Sleepwalking A Diamond Hydronate Trip Report by Dramamine Uploaded to Earwid.org on April 3rd, 2008 At the beginning of this year, I was too broke to buy weed regularly, so I'd resorted to smoking cigarettes like crazy and tripping on DXM. I was looking for something a bit more interesting than the usual disorientation of DXM. I remembered the modest mouse song Dramamine and thought, hell, sounds cool to me. Big mistake. Wish I had heard of this site then. Not that it was a horrible trip, I just wish I had known what I was getting into. My friend and I drove up to CVS and bought a box of Dramamine and later that night, at my own house all alone in my room, I took the pills. The first few were nasty as crap, so I went downstairs and used Sunny D as a chaser. Went back upstairs, turned the light on and began reading a motor trend. After 45 minutes, I was wondering when the fuck this was going to happen. Just then, the words blurred on the page, followed moments later by the entire magazine disappearing, naturally scaring the living shit out of me. I looked at the ground and found the magazine, picked it up, put it aside and turned out the lights. I turned on the Modest Mouse CD. This is a long drive for someone with nothing to think about, the first track of which is Dramamine, an appropriate song. I put the clicker down and realised I had to pee, so I got up and walked down the hall, still fairly lucid, minus the blurred vision. I felt drunk. I ran into every door in the 20 feet to my bathroom. It was pitch black and I couldn't see a damn thing. I finally made it in there and turned on the light when I heard my dad yell something about being quiet and that he was trying to sleep. I pissed and went back to bed. I did the same thing about eight more times, never actually pissing those times though. Once I was done peeing, I went back to my bed and turned the lights out again. I looked over at my stereo and hit play again as the CD had ended. That's when I saw my dad behind my stereo and plugging it. I yelled at him to stop and he just stared blankly at me as I yelled at him. Finally I heard him from the other room when he yelled, SHUT UP! It was about two in the morning at this point. His image in my room wisped away like a cloud of smoke. Very disturbing. At this point, people started walking into my room. People I didn't know. People from all eras of time. People who looked dead, like a walking zombie or something. People looked quite alive as well. All sorts of people. All walking into my room and crawling under my bed. As with any time I see dead people walking, I peed my pants. Though the eight trips to the toilet would have cleaned me out, but no, I peed my pants. I was too afraid to go across my room and feared letting my legs anywhere near the bottom of my bed, for fear that hands would grab them. After about an hour, or at least that's what it felt like, 
I decided that it was safe to stop standing on my bed with a pillow ready to defence. Then I saw my dog at the side of my bed. I was wondering how they got in my room with the door being closed. Then again, that didn't stop all those people. So why I found it strange that my dog got in, I have no idea. I leaned over to pet her and as my hand touched her she whisked away like smoke, in much the same manner as my father had. I got under my sheets and clung to them tightly. I was freaking out. Completely freaking insane feeling. But then I got thirsty, so I went downstairs and was met by my mother, who assumed I was sneaking out. The conversation went something like this. This is how she retold it to me the next morning. I have no recollection of this actually happening. Mum, what do you think you were doing? Me, I need water. No, you're not sneaking out. I'm wearing my boxers only. No, I'm not sneaking out at all. What's with you? You're acting weird. Oh, nothing, I need water. Okay. She reaches for a glass and hands it to me, only to take it away shortly after because I was shaking so much. Then she filled it up for me. Me. I need Pepsi. Sounding frantic. Okay. She hands me the Pepsi, and it's in a wrapper I've never seen before. One that looks just like the wrapper the Dramamine pills come individually wrapped in. I came to, I remember from here on out at that moment. I looked in my hand and thought the pill was a Dramamine. I remember thinking, oh shit, she's caught me. I'm fucked. So I turned around and began walking upstairs with my hand clenched tightly and the water in the other hand. Mum, where are you going? Me. Bed. What's in your hand? Nothing. Are you on a drug? Nah, nah. Are you sleepwalking? Uh, yeah, that's it, that's it. I'm, I'm sleepwalking. Okay, just go to bed and don't get back out tonight. You've been making a racket all night. Holy crap, I was totally flipped out at that point. Went back to my room and attempted to fall asleep. I found that the more I thought about nothing, the more I thought about everything. The next hour or so I remember thinking about everything, but not in words. It was nothing that I could even begin to put into text. It was the most powerful thought I have ever experienced. I learned more in that hour or so than I have in my entire life. Everything fell into place. Everything just made sense. Nothing in the world has looked quite the same since. The beautiful looks more beautiful. The hideous, more hideous. It's just simply the most incredible experience of my life. From what I have read about other people's experiences, they experience much the same scary hallucinations, but no one else seems to have experienced the deep session of thought that I have. That was when drama me was enjoyable and outright euphoric just for the sheer amount of knowledge I gained, just from deep thought. The hallucinations are extremely realistic and actually pretty cool in retrospect. It was not cool at the time however. The scariest experience of my life that was offset by the most amazing euphoric thinking of my life. Not the greatest drug, but it was overall worth it I guess. Jungleberry, a synthetic marijuana trip report from Shroomery. Shit fucked me up. I'm not quite sure where to begin with this. The weekend started off like any other. Call up some friends, ask if they want to smoke up, reach destination, proceed to get blitzed. So we're sitting outside of this cafe, quite a few of us, I'd say eight or maybe nine. The plan was that we were going to have a couple bowls there and then, and go find somewhere to chill to just sit down and have a good time. My friends packed me a bowl of this stuff called jungleberry, which I guess is sort of similar to the K2 spice or whatever, and as per usual, I cane that shit till my lungs are on the verge of combustion. It slowly starts to hit me, but I felt like being ballsy so I asked for a second bowl not 10 seconds from the last. This is where shit starts to hit the fan. For the next 10 minutes I am ridiculously fucking high, and then reality starts to warp. Everything is completely black, but not in the way one would think. 
It wasn't like the colour black, nor the black where you close your eyes. It's the kind of black that exists before you were born, where there is just completely nothing there. Suddenly two specks of colour fade in, a red speck and a purple speck. At this point in time nothing was wrong, just two dots of colour in forever darkness. Now the colour starts to expand and contract, stretch and explode, blend with each other and revert back into dots, and then continue to just go completely insane. It doesn't sound bad, but it was painful. Extremely painful. Why was the rapid expansion and contraction of these two colours hurting me? Well, I have no idea. This felt like it was happening for an infinite amount of time. That I was trapped in this pre-life stage with red and purple colours fucking around forever. Then, instantly it all vanishes. Now this next part is extremely difficult to explain. My mind, like my consciousness, is trapped in an extremely narrow space. But as before, there was nothing there. Just this pre-life darkness. I had to keep my mind moving forward, for if I stopped or turned around, my mind would be consumed by something. I don't know what it was, but it was just something that would consume my mind. The issue was that as my mind was moving forward through this narrow space, terrifying things were spawning in front of my mind, although there was absolutely nothing there. My mind was extremely hesitant and thus it would stop or turn around to try and flee, but end up being consumed by this void. Being consumed by this nothing again was indescribably painful, but as my mind was killed, it would be reborn in another narrow space of pre-life darkness. The amount of times my mind died and was reborn, I can't say. It felt like it was lasting forever and just continued to happen. Another transition occurred. With this repeating phenomena of pre-life darkness, except this time I was looking at myself from a top-down view. There I was, lying in this darkness. Not on any surface, just lying there. Suddenly, everything zoomed into the head of myself lying there in fetal position, and I saw myself sitting in an office chair, the types with rolly wheels and arms. I was tied to it with a thick rope, and I was also in a straitjacket. I began to imagine myself puking, constantly puking for who knows how long, and I could feel myself puking as well. I did indeed end up waking up covered in puke. Another transition this time, I was doing battle with everything in the universe, and luckily enough the surroundings weren't pre-life darkness, but I don't know what they were at all. When I say doing battle with everything in the universe, I don't mean swinging swords at puppies and planets, in fact I don't know what I mean, it's indescribable. In order to win against this everything, I had to time something right in order to pass. Pass through what, I'm not really sure. Time what right? I don't know again. If I mistimed whatever I had to time correctly, I'd be transported to the pre-life darkness for eternity, and then transported back to try and time whatever it is that I had to time correctly. Eventually I ended up timing it right, after an infinite amount of time in this trip, upon which I woke up. But the bad shit doesn't end there. I woke up with absolutely no idea what the fuck had happened to me, where the fuck I was, what life was. I had no idea about anything. Call it 20 minutes of the worst case of amnesia around. It felt like I had been placed onto this earth by something. That at the very point I woke up from the trip, was the very point where I had been brought into existence. All my friends were panicking and asking me if I was okay. I was busy asking them who the fuck they were, 
and where the fuck I was and how the fuck I got here. This lasted for about 20 minutes, until I slowly started to piece reality back together again. Bad idea. A Benadryl trip report, uploaded to Shroomery on the 4th of August 2011. Excuse the typing, I'm really stoned. Hey, I'm going to be talking about my first and last time trying Benadryl. I was on this forum during the beginning of the last school year, I think I was 15. I was reading this forum reading up on shroom trips because I was going to trip soon. I started reading about Benadryl and how it makes you hallucinate, so I thought it would be a good idea to do a low dose of that to prepare for my trip. Now, I know it's not even close to being the same. Shrooms make me feel amazing, and Benadryl makes me feel like I'm in a nightmare. It was like 11pm on a Tuesday night. I was just really excited to hallucinate for the first time. I took 12 pills, around 300mg. I think I took that knowing it was a little much, but I always felt like I had a natural tolerance for pills. And I read that some people take 200 to 250 milligrams and don't trip, they just fall asleep. At 11pm, I took them in my room. Went downstairs to make sure everyone is asleep before I trip. Everyone was. So I went back in my room and it's been like 10 minutes. I don't really feel anything. Just on my laptop and watching TV. It's been like 30 minutes now. I just feel really tired and my stomach kind of hurts. So I decided to roll myself an owl. I thought the cannabis might also help me hallucinate. It's been 40 minutes now, and I go out for a smoke. On my first hit of the blunt, it all hit me like a train. Everything moved like jello, and I could barely keep my neck up. I wasn't able to move at all. I felt like I was so small, and I was trapped to this chair like bait for some creature. After trying to get up for about 5 minutes, I just was too tired, and that's when I saw this huge flying worm in the sky circling me. This whole time, I thought this was real. And I forget I was tripping, all I thought was that I just went out for a smoke. So now I'm sitting there, waiting to die by this huge worm, and if it couldn't get worse, I was getting swarmed by bees and spiders, and I couldn't kill them at all. This went on for what felt like a couple of days, but it was probably only 30 minutes in real time. Finally, the worm came down, its mouth opened wide, and it ate me, and I was in its mouth, and I came back to reality for a sec, and I was like, oh shit. I got to get in my room, so I sneaked back in, stumbling the whole way. I somehow made it back to my room, I don't know how, but for the rest of the night I was trying to watch TV as my whole family was walking through into my room. At first I was like, what the fuck? And then I was like, oh I'm tripping, this is gonna happen in it. It was so weird, they just went in my closet. For some reason after this I couldn't fall asleep, I was just sitting in my room tripping for hours. I finally fell asleep and woke up feeling so weird during the whole school day. So my advice is, don't do Benadryl, like, at all. It's not worth it. Dark Void I Call Home A Mementine Trip Report by It Stings and It Hurts from Eroid Date Publish, March 9th, 2019 I'd only been home for a few hours after my week-long New Year's trip. I'd been staying with friends, drinking and celebrating the beginning of 2017, before I knew I wanted to make my first voyage into the Memenverse that night. I'd begun unpacking my bags and cleaning up the house in preparation for the inevitably prolonged and arduous journey that high doses of memantine always present, before carefully weighing and capping my dose. 150 milligrams of fluffy crystal white powdered memantine hydrochloride. I took my dose orally about 7pm. Knowing full well the duration these trips go for and how long the onset for the drugs to set in take. I began to occupy myself for the first few hours by cooking myself a light meal before tripping, like I always do. 
I found eating before taking the dose can slow down the onset even further than what it already is, and with ample time between taking the dose and it finally kicking in, eating in this window is ideal. After I've eaten and sat down to begin browsing Reddit, the fact I've taken the Mementine has almost completely been forgotten by me. I begin to feel a bit spacey and calm. I light up a cigarette, like after most meals, and notice the slow wisps of smoke dancing around my hand. This is when I remembered about the Mementine, about two hours after taking the dose. To really set myself up for a relaxing come up I put on Pink Floyd's Wish You Were Here album, queuing up a few hours worth of psych rock, alt electro and anything else I could find that helped guide my self reflecting calm mindset I was entering. By about 10pm, plus 3 hours after dosing, I would begun to peak. My depth perception had lost all focus. Not quite enough to force double vision but enough that objects close to me like my laptop or hands felt like they were fluctuating between being hundreds of metres away, making me feel like a giant, or incredibly close to me, feeling like I was somehow a tiny person laying on my bed. The walls had started warping, and the less I focused on my surroundings and more on my laptop and hands, my perception of reality just outside those objects had all but vanished. It was like sitting in a void with only my very immediate surroundings present. At this point I find darkness to let visuals take hold much more, almost as if letting my mind's imagination of what could be there much more real than my distorted perception of what actually is there. I turn off the lights and only let the faint glow of the half moon from the window illuminate my room. Staring into the darkness, watching as my room would transform into vast cathedrals or otherworldly dimensions, I lose track of time. Although memantine causes a diminished response to nicotine, I still find the habit of smoking incredible when I'm on my journey. It can pull apart my sense of balance and in this particular instance, the world began spinning around me and I had no choice but to just sit there and watch it tear apart into a dark structureless space. Possibly one of the most beautiful experiences I've had on memantine yet. I lay in that void for what feels like maybe 20 to 30 minutes before it began crashing down around me and I briefly returned to reality. Memantine tends to come in waves, so these 5 to 10 minute windows of mild sobriety are opportunities for me to go to the bathroom and get water to stay hydrated. Given the duration of Memantine, each trip can give me a lot of particularly interesting experiences and it would be impossible to explain or let alone remember every single one of them but there's still two particular events during this trip I want to try and explain. After long periods of laying in the dark, my eyes became very adjusted to seeing very low amounts of light, and at one point after sitting up to stretch I noticed a tiny orange light in the corner of my room. I just sat there staring at it trying to work out what it could possibly have been, for longer than I care to admit. It began to slide away into the distance and the more I focused on it, the further it seemed to get. Slowly the room around it turned into a tunnel, funneling all my vision down onto this faint orange dot. The walls had become red tendrils, crawling over each other to get out. Unfazed and calm about being stuck in this hole of this bizarre situation, I started to try and climb towards the dot, to only very abruptly find myself face first off the bed onto the floor. Reality snapped back in around me, and the orange dot was just a light on the charger for my laptop. Duh. The other notable occurrence, a particularly strange and very lifelike visual, was during the very last legs of the trip. I tend to fall asleep about 10 hours into a trip if I start around the same time, 7pm, and a hypnagogic state of consciousness can be achieved. Mimantine tends to be just stimulating enough to keep me awake during most of the peak, and wears off just enough that the visuals can still be present as I'm falling asleep. I was staring at my wall as my mind had started wandering, watching it swirl and warp different shapes and patterns, but slowly a young girl's face pressed out of the wall. It appeared like she was carved out of clay, 
beautiful and calm, long wispy hair, but trapped in the wall. I could see into her eyes, glassy and clear. She was emotionless and never blinking, and her eyes followed me as I leaned over the edge of my bed. I felt like I knew her, but looking back now I know I had never seen her in my life before. We stared into each other's eyes for several minutes before she slowly sunk back into the wall where she emerged, leaving a dark mist as I finally fell asleep. Waking up around 10am, plus 15 hours after dosing, I still felt heavily dissociated, my body still numbed and distant. I get up to go pee, stumbling with no sense of balance and eventually go back to sleep for several hours. Today is plus 48 hours since dosing and I'm still feeling mildly dissociated, tired and uncoordinated, but like usual it's slowly improving. This is somewhere in the vicinity of my 20th high dose Mementine trip, so it's nothing out of the ordinary, but I don't think I'm used to it yet. Being disconnected from reality for a solid 12 hours is not something one grows accustomed to very easily. The Desert of the Real, a Salvia Divinorum trip report by Zonka, uploaded to Irwid.org on June 14th, 2005. When I ordered the Salvia online, I was at the end of my rope. Seven years of counselling, psych drugs, a psych ward and plenty of recovery group work, and I still felt lied to. My world was spiralling out of my control. Hell, it had never been in my control in seven years. My vices were going to end my life but I looked and acted just like everyone I knew. I believed I had given the allopathic model of medicine more than a fair try, and had found it to be worse than worthless. I was desperate. I hadn't even seen a mushroom in that entire time, and didn't know where to look. I remember someone mentioning salvia, so I looked it up online and ordered some. During the three days it took to arrive, I carved a chillum from hardwood, heat seasoned and oiled it. Even before I got home that day, I knew the salvia would be waiting. I retired to my silent room, toweled the door, cracked the window and loaded up. I took the first hit. I must have misread the description on the order page. I thought it said that smoked salvia took 15 minutes to kick in, and eaten salvia 30 minutes. Imagine my surprise when I blew out the second inhalation and found myself in the twilight zone. My room rippled like fire, like everything was made of fire. I had a fan on in the room and the curtain actually was rippling. The motion caught my eye, and I looked. What a strange sight it was. I saw elfin, smiling faces dancing in the fabric. They beckoned to me enthusiastically, saying, Come on, come on, tell us about Texas. Tell us about Texas, come on. It seemed really important to them. Actually, I felt far out of my depth, but acting as if I had power gave me power, if you can understand that. Just a minute, I said. I'm going to hit this thing again. I managed to draw another toke, but couldn't feel my body when I exhaled. It was more like watching myself on a movie screen. I put the chillum down. All this happened in about a minute, from the first effects to the third toke. The little elf guys were still in the curtain when I looked again, and I thought about a lyric in a cramps track. Spiders in my eyelids and ghosts in the cheese. What in the world's come over me? I've lost touch with reality. Well, I figured I was game to tell the elves about Texas, so I tentatively drew back the curtain a couple of inches and saw, to my joy, my cactus plants on the windowsill. I felt myself drawn to the five inch gap in the sash while my cacti egged me on. Come on, out here, tell us about Texas. Somehow, while this was going on, I felt the presence of someone in the room. It was as if my housemate had walked in on me to ask me to borrow my... something or other, and asked if I was okay. I was so far out that I believed it was possible, even though I couldn't see him. Just to be safe, I said aloud. If you're standing right in front of me, I couldn't begin to describe this. It also seemed safer not to try to jump out the window, so I closed the curtain and knelt down to pray. 
I prayed for just and peaceful leaders for seven generations, for an age of lowered expectations and regrowth, among other things. It was a bit of an effort to concentrate on positivity and hope, as if from within an adjacent room in my mind, I felt muffled violence and saw blurred images of gore. Yet for all of that, there on my knees I was safe and in control. The prayer held back the bad vibes. While some part of me was praying and holding back the negativity, another part was aware of other travellers telepathically. The sudden bizarre high reminded me of bad craziness, obviously, and I felt in contact with mental patients and my shady pothead neighbours. I could hear their conversation in my head. I felt like I was near the periphery of sanity, so I prayed for the earth. As I sank below the psychosphere, I felt alone. Isn't that a metaphor for my life? Caring about the earth and feeling alone. I became aware of the presence of a reserved academic being. I felt approval and may have heard encouraging sounds. It was as if I had bumped into somebody in the shadows, someone who was trying not to call attention to themselves. I felt like I had impressed a beloved teacher. While coming down, I reflected that although most of my mind was distorted and tripping, there was still a deeper consciousness that was unchanged. That was me, kneeling on my bed and praying for the earth to hold it together. I also got a neat little visual special effect of some desert flowers on a poster becoming three-dimensional. When things calmed down a bit, my straight-laced housemate came home with a date, jumped into bed and started getting on with her. Holding my position, unmoving for ten or so minutes, really made my back hurt. Eventually I eased myself down and feigned sleep until I could make a more dignified exit. On the way out of the room, I noticed that the towel was still under the door. No one had entered. I had imagined it. The next day, I felt like I could control my own mind for the first time in years. I felt powerful and able to deal with my junks. My gloomy, depressed world was replaced by a strange, alien, cheery place with bright colours. I could smell the earth. When people looked at me, they smiled, on the day after I smoked Salvia Divinorum. I did notice that I was a bit more irritable than usual, but only briefly. Overall, I am glad that I took the trip. However, I still feel like something's not right. I feel so much better after smoking some weird herb I got online. All that medicine, all that psychotherapy, and all that work just left me feeling powerless, helpless and hopeless. Aren't I supposed to feel worse when I take matters into my own hands? Don't I have to pay a lot for coal tar derived meds and hire a medicine man to monitor me? Now I have some hard choices to make. How can I return to my day to day? My recovery group seems like a joke now, but all my friends are doing it. I don't know how to function outside of AA. Should I leave or try to fake it and blend in? We'll see. Death and Psychic Dinosaurs I was on my way to drink at my friend C's house with some friends. I took a walk through the botanical gardens, sipping on a bottle of red wine. It was a nice night, and my mind was wandering the astral airwaves, mostly dwelling on my obsession with the arcane and the surreal at the time. I'm fairly certain that was a major factor in my decision to pick a couple of blood red angel trumpets on the way. I had no plans to indulge at that point, but for whatever reason, it seemed like a good idea. At my friends, we drank quietly and watched skateboarding videos. I'm not particularly close to these people, in fact I wasn't particularly close to anyone at this point. Mostly, we just shared an interest in skateboarding. After an hour or so, we decided to go to a party at another friend's house a few minutes walk away. I wasn't enjoying this party, but I did the human thing and drunk and smoked and chat about the real world. At some point, a friend, 
S, asked if I had any sweet drugs. As a joke, I presented him with my Datura flowers. He responded with a firm, fuck that, and we discussed my hellish experiences with the drug, concluding that I shouldn't do it again. But after a moment of introspection, I said to S, Hey S, last trip? And munched down the two flowers and washed them down with red wine. I didn't place very much emphasis on this decision, but in hindsight, my life was lacking anything to give it structure or meaning, and I felt free to roam the world of chaos. But my memory of the night faded to dreams and confusion at this point, but I believe I sat quietly in a chair. I imagine this to be around midnight. My first coherent memory. Quite oblivious to the fact that I had lost my shoes and pants, I was trying to get into a flat I had lived at about a year ago, about half an hour away from the party. I had imagined my key in my hand, but it wasn't working at all. I soon noticed I had an older man in my company. That's Olive's house, he told me. So I knocked loudly. A middle-aged lady answered, yelling at me to fuck off. My response was something along the lines of, Sorry, I, I thought I lived here. And I wandered off. At this point, I had no idea I was under the influence, and it seemed like a reasonable mistake to make. The man looking for Olive disappearing wasn't particularly disconcerting either. After remembering where I lived, I started heading in that direction. I experienced a frightening hallucination soon after. I was walking past an island on the road. There was a small sign on it, about waist high. In my questionable judgement, this sign was a small one-legged girl holding a sign. I thought it was very sweet that someone had found a job for her, and started walking towards her. From the other side of the road, as if to mirror me, a dark and seemingly featureless man was walking towards her as well. He reached her before me, and proceeded to viciously bind her with some kind of masking tape while she resisted and screamed a muffled cry. By the time I reached her, the attacker had vanished and the girl had become a street sign. I was convinced he had turned this girl into a street sign in a most inhumane manner. My next memory is reaching C's house. I have since been told that this was about 7am. C's flatmate D answered the door waiting for a package. He then went and got C. I thought it was my package, but it was just him in fucking hot pants. In C's room, he very seriously told me that when we left his place, I still had my pants on, but I wasn't convinced. I was lapsing in and out of believing this was my room, and began leafing through his belongings. Apparently I was talking very quietly and slowly. He told me later that I had asked to borrow his pants, and he said to ask D to borrow his. To this I replied, that would be opening a can of worms, and walked off. I'm surprised that in all my fucked upness, I could manage an offhand remark like that. D later said that after I left, I stood for like a quarter hour on their doorstep. I remember looking in their window and seeing swirling etheric forms morphing very seamlessly from demon faces to small scenes. I then spent a while trying to get into my bedroom from C's house. The walk home was terrifying. I lived almost an hour away and had to deal with the constant realisation that I was fucked up, pantless and totally delusional. I kept finding fingers in the pocket of my hoodie and mistaking the folds in the end of my sleeves for various items. I hoped to god my underwear was real. I also kept imagining my skateboard in my hands and would go to get on it and stumble. Horrifying hallucination too. It seemed to be in an industrial eraser head esque area that I did not recognise. I spotted out of the corner of my eye a chubby girl in a McDonald's uniform dancing. She noticed me and stopped suddenly and started walking very slowly before tripping over. She started to scream, so I walked towards her and she started regurgitating a fetus. It sounded very painful. Before I reached her, the familiar featureless bastard emerged from nowhere, 
stomped the fetus and gave me a most evil glare. I ran away. I've never been so terrified before or since. For the majority of my walk home, I felt like I was extremely fucked a minute ago before interacting with one of my hallucinations. I kept imagining the company of various people in my life and I heard my name constantly. One of my friends tried to show me a dead body he'd found, but I didn't want to hear about it. He gave me a very hurt look as I walked away. I had a five second memory and walked around in a lot of circles. Someone mentioned that my attire was creative. I thought he was talking about my hoodie and mentioned how the hood did its job better than most. All the way home I felt like I was hearing people's thoughts. There were usually a few trains of thought going through their heads at once. I could hear them notice me, then notice my lack of clothes, then decide to avoid my eyes. A few times people's thoughts pointed out things about me that I hadn't noticed, like I was wearing one sock. Eventually, I made it to the botanical gardens, and my trip took a turn for the better. I could hear the trees talking, and my hallucinatory friends stuck around long enough to have elaborate discussions. It still seemed to be normal for them to turn into trees, fence posts, etc. when they finished talking to me. I was phasing in and out of awareness of the fact that I was hallucinating, but I was always delusional. I thought I was saving face in front of the real people who were going about their mornings by telling my hallucinations that I knew they weren't there. In reality, I was angrily yelling, Leave me alone. I know you're not real. To no one. It was raining by this point, and I noticed that the fallen leaves were set up to display intricate scenes, like a timeline of the universe. This was worth all the terror and confusion of the trip, and I spent a very long time sitting in a puddle learning about the universe. Apparently the dinosaurs had psychic battles and were all linked up in some kind of morphic field. They eventually killed them when they became competitive with each other within this field, destroying it from the inside. This was a most amazing hallucination that still inspires me with its intricacy. Even now that I realise there was not in fact a hippie sitting there and carefully arranging the leaves, the feeling of amazement that someone had that inhuman level of patience and attention to detail was so powerful that I still draw on it for artistic inspiration. As I was leaving the gardens, my friend tried to say hi to me, but I explained to him that he wasn't real and kept walking. I turned to look at him several times, expecting to see him turn into a rock, but for an unexpectedly long time, he just stared at me with puppy eyes. He did turn into a rock in the end. I was happy to be on the home stretch, as I lived about 10 minutes away. I was manifesting objects in my hand to an impressive standard of realism. I walked past a lady and heard her say something like, Bit tired, huh? I begged her pardon and she said she didn't say anything. I said I must be tired and kept walking. Making it home was a huge relief. I was free to enjoy the visuals in peace, as my flatmates at the time were well used to my antics. As I wandered around the house, it was as if everything I'd ever experienced there was happening at once. I'd walk into the kitchen and find myself in a random conversation I'd had in that part of the kitchen. There were dozens of versions of each of my flatmates going about days they had in the past. Eventually I went to bed and had a waking life series of vivid and surreal conversations with people I had or had not encountered. I talked to my older brother, who died about three years earlier, which was another thing that made the trip worthwhile. I don't remember what we talked about, just being vaguely aware that he was dead and feeling very awkward about bringing it up. After an incredibly eventful sleep, I spent the next few days cleaning up the mess I made, finding new skate shoes, getting a new phone and cards. I'm afraid to ask the cops if anyone handed my jeans in, as my phone was full of dodgy texts. Mostly I spent the next week or so living in a haze. I think I blacked out for about 7 hours and tripped for well over 24 hours. 
but I didn't feel normal for over a week. To those of you out there interested in exploring this world, I'd recommend doing something to stop yourself going wandering. I have no way of knowing what happened during my blackout, which makes me feel somewhere between disturbed and frustrated. Some of the more frightening visions stayed with me for months, so you'd do well to be fairly mentally stable, I guess. It doesn't matter how experienced you are with hallucinogens, as far as I was concerned, the world was behaving strangely around me. For most of the trip, I had no idea I was fucked up, and the moments of clarity were few and far between. The best moments were in my bed exploring my mind, and I'm in two minds about whether it was worth the terror, confusion, and the depression that followed, even for someone like me who, at the time, lived for that shit. But overall, I think the time spent in terror wasn't any more prominent than the time spent in awe. It was the best of times. It was the blurst of times. Be careful. A Love Lost An AMT trip report by Z1D Weber Drugs have been a part of me for around two years now. What I experienced two days ago inevitably changed me forever. Life is something we cannot give or take from someone. It is built into us. You cannot tear the soul from someone or steal their psyche. Every individual is a temple of our own imagination, reality, thought, consciousness, being. It would be a waste of time to babble on about my feelings about life at this point, so I'll save you the time and maybe teach you something. I've been using AMT, or Foxy, for a few months now. I have had around five experiences with AMT, and many more with Foxy. To me, AMT was a gift. For 12 hours on any certain day, my mood would be lifted, and I would appreciate everything around me. I just sit here and think about that saying, you never know what you had until you lose it. We had just started school a few weeks ago, and our group of friends had already been coming to school under the influence of various drugs. My girlfriend was always against my drug habits, and would always pester me about them. I guess now she just gave up or something. I loved her with all of my heart, and truly believed we had something special, something that would last an eternity. I never knew that my utter stupidity would destroy the one thing dearest to me in my life. My girlfriend, we'll call her Kay, started watching what I was doing. She began to get interested in drugs and how they affected me. She was always open-minded and creative. She was just so perfect. As she became more and more interested, the topic of trying drugs herself came up. Since our families, or lack of, had their differences, we would only see each other at school most of the time. Though I thought about the consequences of trying a substance at school for the first time, I remember saying to myself, bad stuff only happens to other people. <laughs> I just wish I could turn back time. Meanwhile, I was selling Foxy and AMT at school to close friends, and was pulling in a nice amount of cash, which, however, didn't weigh out the risk. But I kept doing it. I guess I found myself some type of thrill or exhilaration in my endeavours, or maybe I was just stupid. So we set a date for Kay's first Fox experience, and that day me, Kay and F, close friend, came to school and dosed on Foxy. Me and F had 15 milligrams since we were experienced, and I gave Kay 12 milligrams. All in all, she loved it. It was probably one of the best things to happen to her in a long time. I guess I felt proud of myself for making her so happy, but on the other hand, her excitement worried me. Regardless, a week later we had a brilliant idea. I was going to let her try some AMT, which was sure to raise her spirits and give her what she needed. We were both very excited. The plan was to dose at 5 in the morning by giving F and K a drink to take home the night before, so they could dose the next morning before school. 
The night before, I gave them their doses. I talked to my brother Jay, who was in sense, the drug lord. He handled the chemicals. I sold them. I told him what I needed and I went to bed. He told me he would put it in the drinks and refrigerate them. It was no doubt he was tired after a day of work, but he assured me that I could get some sleep and he would leave them out for tomorrow. The next morning, I woke up and dosed. The 40 milligrams, or so I thought, of AMT was mixed in orange juice, so it wasn't that bad of a taste. An hour after I dosed, I started feeling the beginning effects, so I started getting ready for school. When it was time to go, I walked outside of the house and immediately knew something was different. As I walked in the school, my movements were fluid, like I was walking underwater. At that point, I knew something was up. I had taken AMT before and it was never anything like this. When I met F and K in the morning, I asked them how they were doing and they said they were alright. I asked my girlfriend if she liked it and unlike her response with Foxy which was, oh my god yes, she just said, it's okay I guess, which kinda worried me, but I didn't think anything of it. Here is when I noticed something was very wrong. It was becoming increasingly intense around two hours into it, and I told F and K that this is normal, and J probably gave us a few milligrams extra. I walked with K to her classes for the first two periods. Second period, she told me something was wrong. I asked her how she was doing and if she liked it, and she said no. This got me very upset. I started really worrying, fearing she was going to have a bad trip. She lied to me obviously and told me she was fine and it's okay and even told me it's fun after she knew I was getting really worried. After she left for her next class, I calmed down and just thought that AMT wasn't powerful enough to excite a full blown bad trip and I thought she would just kind of roll out of it. So I stopped worrying and destined myself to have a great time. The next period was the peak. At that point I knew I was on something much more than just 40 milligrams. I was getting incredible closed eye and open eye visuals and a lot of traces which didn't bother me. I felt that anything in the world could go wrong and I would still be as happy as I was at that point. I was having the best trip of my life. During fifth period, Kay's lunch period, I was walking down the hall to go to the bathroom and I passed a school administrator that had one of those walkie talkies on. It must have been God's will that gave me the urge to go into that hall and pass that administrator at that exact time. I had heard over the walkie talkie, my girlfriend's full name, needs to be escorted out of the building. I stopped dead in the hallway and the worst fear ran through my body. At first I thought it was a hallucination, but my better wits told me it was very, very real. I was totally panicked. I started walking around the empty hallway searching for some sign that this was really happening, but I didn't find one. I started thinking that maybe something happened that didn't involve her tripping, but I blew that out of my mind. I was never so panicked in my life. I had no idea what to do. I started thinking that maybe this was a hallucination, but the fear still remained. From that point on to the sixth period, I was getting visuals of police officers which I knew was a hallucination. I was very scared. I thought I was going to have a very bad trip. During my lunch period, I saw my friend who was drug free and I told him I was tripping and he asked how I was doing. I told him I'm fine, but I think there's something wrong with Kay. She might be hurt, I don't know. He told me I'm tripping and to calm down. He treated me like a baby, like everything I was saying came from some insane person. I also saw a few of my other friends who knew I was tripping and know Kay very well. I talked to them and they told me they heard that something happened with Kay. This reassured my worst fear. Most of them told me they heard rumours about people telling them that Kay was rolling so hard that she was biting her lips so hard that it was bleeding. Others told me that something just happened to her. I was so scared. I decided to leave the cafeteria and go out to the courtyard and talk to my friend alone and see if he could reassure me of something. Well, it just so happened that there was also one of those officials out in the courtyard 
and yes, he had a walkie-talkie on as well. That wasn't out of the ordinary at our school. I started hearing words from the walkie-talkie, and then the worst part. I heard them say my full name. I totally freaked out. My friend calmed me down and said I might have just heard it, but then they said it again and he heard it. We went back to the cafeteria and our group of friends started talking, and I told them what happened and asked them what to do and all. They helped me out a lot. I was still very much tripping. I went through my school bag, pocket and everything and threw out everything I knew that had to do with drugs. All the notes from Kay that talked about his tripping and even a dose container. It saved me a lot of trouble cleaning my school bag. I was never so nervous in my life. I walked to my last period class, but on the way there I saw a group of administrators in the hall. It was my grade level administrator, the principal, two police officers, and the head of the district. This was high school, by the way. They immediately told me to step into the office. This was the end of me. I was never lower. I tried to remain calm, but it was hard. They brought me to a room and I sat down with them. They told me I'm in a lot of trouble. Of course, I played dumb, thankfully. They started asking me if I gave anything to Kay today, so of course I denied it. Then they started telling me about Kay, which blew my mind. They told me that during fifth period, her lunch period, she flipped out totally and she had to be taken to the hospital and restrained. They told me she was in very bad shape. Again, I denied all of their accusations that I was involved. They then looked into my eyes, which were all pupil. They asked me if I was under the influence of anything, and they tried to fool me into cracking under pressure. They messed with my mind trying to get me to admit to it, but luckily my defences were up. At that point they called my house. I live with my grandma, so that's who they talked to. They told us that I was probably under the influence of something, and that I gave some kind of drug to my girlfriend and she's hospitalised. My grandma rushed to school and blah blah blah. Bottom line, since I denied everything, and when they searched my school bag they found nothing, I was set free. They didn't suspend me or anything, at least not yet, but I had to go for a drug test, urine and blood. Epilogue. It is now Sunday as I'm writing this. Kay is out of the hospital, but the establishment she lives in is prohibiting me from ever seeing or talking to her again, and the school expelled her. I'm never going to see her again. Depending on the drug test results, which aren't looking too good, I might be suspended or worse. I'm assuming there is a search warrant for the house, so my brother is getting rid of the chems. I'm not sure if the establishment Kay lives in will press charges, and if I will have to go to court to defend myself. I found out today why this happened. My brother Jay gave us all extremely high doses. It was a mistake. He was tired and didn't measure right. I'm guessing from what he told me that me and F were on a somewhere above 60 milligrams and K was on 45 milligrams. Her first time. I just wish I could turn back time to recover. One last time I mixed DPH with DXM in what was later to be noticed as a stupidly high dose. I was with my friends and all at once I went from dead sober to completely ripped out of reality. My friends turned into Simpsons characters with devil horns. They were yellow and animated looking. Words were surreal and conversations took a lot of effort. Just relaying to them that I was strongly tripping seemed like I was trying to contact the past. I left the table where we were playing some sort of card game and drinking beer, and I entered another room where I saw ants and a green slime all over the wall. The ants were collecting the slime in several spots on the walls and moved at random, no patterns. I said to my friend that I was worried his parents would come home and know we were high if we didn't clean up the ants or slime. For the rest of the trip I would periodically forget I was high and once again tell my friend we should clean the walls or we would get caught. I must have said this six times or so. We'll have to go to a corner store for snacks or something. I don't know why we did that. I was terrified. 
I was absolutely not in reality. Everything looked alien and the landscape was completely different. I literally thought we had gone to another planet. It looked nothing like Earth. Standing outside the store because I couldn't go in, I saw vast highways of spaceships in the sky. This is when I realised and was 100% convinced we weren't on Earth, but for some reason this really didn't bother me. It seemed so natural and proper. We arrived back at my buddies and they put on Guitar Hero. I tried to scrape the slime off the wall but it was very sticky and I was afraid of getting ants on my arms, so I gave up. I played Guitar Hero which sounded like words not guitar notes. That proved to be too trippy and I gave up. I started feeling damn delirious and it seemed all my friends couldn't hear me anymore. I knew they could but when they would respond to me I wouldn't understand it and it happened so quick I couldn't remember if they did answer me. From this point until we slept, I laid in one spot on the floor curled up because my three friends were on the couch and what I saw still scares me to this day seven years later. All of their eyes, ears, noses and mouth were pouring blood. It ran down their faces and down the torsos and onto the floor where it streamed to different places in puddles. I could smell it and it was very unpleasant. Then to make it worse, spiders started crawling out of their mouths. They came out at an alarming rate and violently. I watched as my friends bled from every orifice and vomited spiders. The spiders all came and surrounded me, but there was an invisible glass chamber I perceived myself sitting in because the spiders would come within 6 inches of me all 360 degrees around, but couldn't get on me. This was relieving because I am terrified of spiders. I remember sitting there completely terrified for hours watching this happen to my friends. And then I fell asleep under a coffee table, because it was the only spot that wasn't covered in blood or infested with spiders, which were building webs all around the house. Upon asking my friends what I looked like while I watched spiders and blood pour from their faces for what seemed like hours, they told me that I mentioned spiders and blood and looked freaked right out and it did last roughly two hours, but they said I was not sitting on the floor, I was actually pacing around the room muttering about ants and slime and spider webs all of which I still was convinced needed to be cleaned up or else would get caught by his parents in the morning. I made remarks about the spiders building webs and how it was hurt to have spiders crawling out of your mouth, but I never said these things to my friends, I just muttered them. They thought I was going crazy, because apparently nobody tripped as hard as I, and they still had a decent grip on reality. This trip report is not to scare people off using DOB but serves to demonstrate the possible dangers of redosing before truly identifying a substance and the need for a trip sitter. I was given two tabs of DOB at an unknown strength, under the impression that it was LSD, and this led to an overdose resulting in a coma. Rhabdomyolysis, which is a condition where uh, the skeletal muscle breaks down and symptoms include muscle pains and weakness and vomiting, and there's also tea coloured urine which is a hallmark of it, as well as cuts, bruises and physical scarring. My experiences with psychedelic drugs prior to this trip include 5-MeO-DMT, DMT, ayahuasca, mescaline, MXE, ketamine, allad, salvia divinorum, LSD, LSA, 2CB, 25 M-bomb, with LSD having been well taken over 50 times, often in high doses of 1 milligram. Note, parts of this experience had to be re-remembered post-trip during the weeks of recovery that followed, and as such, will feature at the end of my report narrated in the style in which I experienced them. The Trip 10 o'clock Sunday It was a warm, sunny Sunday morning, and the fallout from a friend's party the night before. I hadn't slept having consumed amphetamine and MDMA at the party, and when Kay woke up, we both decided that it would be nice to buy some acid and go to the park. Given the sunny weather, it would be a nice way to wind down the weekend. So we left Kay's flat to buy the acid that her friend had for sale. 11 o'clock. Having met Kay's friend and bought the tabs, he decided to join us in going to the park, picking up his friend on the way. I took my first tab at 11am, holding it under my tongue until it turned to mush. In my sleepless, joyful state, I thought nothing of the metallic taste, reminiscent of a 25 M-bomb tab. After two hours having consumed three to four beers in the park, 
and having felt only a subtle change in headspace, similar to a LSA or a low dose of LSD, I decided to take a second tab. Within half an hour of taking this, the effects really started to kick in, and it was apparent that these were not weak tabs by any means. My stomach became taut, muscles tightened and body engulfed in an all over tingling. My visual field awash with bright aqua and turquoise patterns, and thoughts a shifting paradigm between unabated arrogance and childlike confusion. This energy, euphoria and childlike excitement was bliss. 2 o'clock Sunday We eventually decided to leave the park. The heat had become too much to bear, and as we left I felt a rush of excitement in simply deciding what rubbish we should put in the bin, and what was simply not our responsibility, such as chewing gum, tissue, plastic straws, etc, that had already been there. These feelings took me back to my first trip on LSA, and feeling the most intense excitement at the thought of tidying up. After leaving the park, Kay wanted to head back to her flat. I didn't particularly want to go, but joined her regardless. The walk there seemed to take forever in the blistering heat, and was extremely exhausting physically. By the time we reached her flat, I was literally dripping with sweat. My white t-shirt saturated, and the visuals had intensified to where I could hardly see anything in front of me. They've taken on a static-like quality similar to the visual distortion from standing up too fast and getting a head rush. The details in Kay's face have become prickled with the heat, objects on the floor reduced to indiscernible static. As I look out the back of Kay's second floor, I become mesmerised by the large overgrown tree that takes on a jungle-like quality in the heat and sun. My vision of the tree begins to slice, as the sound of crickets in the tree's deeply saturated leaves stir up feeling of nature and exploration. My visual haze fades and a wall of calm falls over me as I observe the difference between the hot jungle out there and the cool tranquility in the flat. With the tranquility and coolness, my ego falls away. My cockiness, excitement and egotism replace with quiet, introverted thoughts and a willingness to simply observe. Social interaction becomes an alien concept as I turn inwards on myself. Subtle paranoia about having to converse with K creeps in. Conversations seem only to be a tool for others to impose their power and will on you, and in this state I am ill-equipped for any power struggle or conversation. 5 o'clock on Sunday. Two hours later and I'm in a flat downstairs from Kay's with two friends. Kay has left to go to the pub down the road while it's still sunny. It's around 5pm at this point. An awkward situation had arisen that led me to being in this flat. Kay had invited a friend over who insisted that we go and visit my friends in the flat downstairs, who she also knew. She did this by banging on the doors and windows to their flat in a very aggressive manner until she was let in. Whilst I had not been banging on the doors and windows, I felt guilty by proxy, and could see that my two friends clearly wanted to be left alone. All while this was happening, my trip was becoming more intense. At points I felt like reality was a grand play all being performed for me. I was sitting on a sofa bemused at the hostilities and arguments taking place before me. The only audience member in a cosmic play of my design. The flat was the only universe that I knew, and anything outside of it no longer existed in my mind. At this point I knew I was beyond functioning. My memories of what followed become fragmented and blotchy. Intensive care unit, hospital, at 12 o'clock on Monday. I woke up in an ICU hospital bed with a kind looking chubby man at the end of it staring at a monitor. Coming out of both of my arms are tubes. Two in my left and two in my right. Two at the crook and two near the thumb. There is a tube also attached to my face near my nose. I notice a catheter coming out of my penis and instinctively try to remove it. The man insists I don't do this and removes it for me. I'm quite bemused by the situation, not understanding the severity of what has happened or how I arrived there. I am also still seeing the visual effects of the drug. Posters on the wall near my bed fold up in a crumpled paper effect, and there is a cold, hazy blue glistening effect to the air. I look at the clock on the wall. I should be in work. Not understanding the trauma my body's been through, 
the fact that I was in a coma on a breathing machine. I insist on being discharged, and whilst trying to get out of bed, I notice cuts and bruises on my legs. I struggle to get to the edge of the bed and sit there when I realise that I can't walk. My body aches all over and feels as heavy as lead. A doctor comes by and explains that it's not advisable I leave. I could suffer kidney failure and be on dialysis for the rest of my life if I leave now. My blood creatine levels were way above normal at 54,200. On this advice, I decided to stay. I was transferred out of the ICU that day and stayed in hospital for a further four days before being discharged. The trip re-remembered, disconnect with reality. This happened at six o'clock on Sunday. I'm in the second flat. The atmosphere is calmer now that Kay and her friend have left. I peer through the blinds to see outside, but I can't see the outside world. Just dull coloured blocks making a wall where the window used to be. They're painted like the inside of a stick of rock, dull purples and oranges. This room isn't real. It's a matrix, fake area put together for me, so they can steal my bank details without me realising. A fake room to keep me entertained. I look at the bank card. I can't read any of the digits or text. Is it my bank card or oyster card I'm looking at? The whole card is pulsing with neon light and energy, covering all the text. I pace the flat in a state of great agitation. All the rooms in this flat look the same. As I pass through the hall there are people sitting on the wall like gargoyles, loitering. I don't recognise them. The frames of the doors are now glowing neon and the air has taken on a thickness. Moving from one room to another is like looking at a mirror facing another mirror infinite repetitions. I keep on going to leave, going room to room, in a state of turmoil. I don't know what to do. As I leave through the front door of the flat, my friends call me back. I keep on thinking I have to leave, but my friends keep calling me back. The fact I haven't left is the common denominator. That's why nothing changes. What needs to change? I get out the flat and into the main hallway. I have been here a few times before and always pushed the front door to get out. I pull this time on the door to open to the world. Exposure. It's still blindingly bright outside. I see a man walk by me with a dog. Do I know him? Is that B? No, the man replies with a grin on his face. His voice sounds muffled and distant, as does mine. I say something else, but can't tell what I've said as it sounds too obscure. I don't know, B, he says. He seems to find it funny that I've asked him such a strange question. The sun has begun to set, and as I walk through the rows of terraced houses, I'm a cop, head of a futuristic police force, starring on a TV show. I'm rehearsing my lines for a big bust that will be televised, about to do a bust on one of those properties. I'm in contact with another officer who is in the ether, who is also me. I have clearly disconnected with reality, not aware anymore of where I am, present dangers, talking out loud to myself. My sci-fi daydream has bled into reality and replaced it, depersonalised and delirious. I feel the presence of something vicious coming for me, being passed from one dimension to another like a hot potato, coming my way. Nobody had ever had to deal with something as horrifying as this. Before it happened it was unfathomable, unthinkable, had never happened. It was as if I was going to be assaulted for the first time in history, in a world where there was no physics. I was going to be the first of my kind bludgeoned to death by a crazed hammer wielding homeless man. A black grid overlays itself in the sky in front of me, and coming towards me through the grid is this monster, constructed in black wire, unfathomable in strength, ripping in two. Sheer terror. It's a behemoth, heading towards me with pure anger, and it's going to tear me in half. It breaks free of the grid, twisting up outside of it, breaking free. Time's one quintillion stronger than any force and heading for me. I could see in my mind a person being ripped apart from the inside by a black kitten-like creature constructed of wire that spread around its insides like liquid fire. I can hear and feel this, 
thick yellow pus bubbling and terrified screams, possibly my own, as the demon kitten tears up the human's insides. This pain was of a ripping, tearing nature, and maybe when I cut my left hand. I'm now the front of someone's garden, walking down some concrete step towards a house. I lose my balance multiple times but don't fall. I look at my watch for some reason as I plunge. The grass is so overgrown that I cannot see my footing, and as I look up at the sky, it has grown dark as a grass visual jungle motif reaches up to the graying clouds. My vision is getting darker. Fade to black, a total closed eye visual world comprised of complex black line grid geometries. A universe comprised of mathematical grids and dread. I hear the bleeps, police codes being said over this dark universe. Code 1, 6. These sounds echo through the darkness. Hello? Name. Can you hear me? Surname. Echoing off into infinity. Beep. We're here to help you. Name. Hello? Name. Can you hear me? Beep. We're here to help you. Name. I can see all these creatures resembling triangular mice in the darkness clinging to the grids. A vague dull light glints across the triangle offspring critters and disturb them as they sit on the grid. I assume this was a light being shined across my eyes by medical professionals on scene. There are twelve families of Beelzebub coding and recorded every vile mental abuse in this world. Incest, physical pain, abuse, self-hatred and torment, documenting every form, every corner of its domain. All these bleeps, voices, so distant in space, echo and overlay, fading past the grids. They fade with the beings the offspring, their billionaire overlords and their district police. There is hierarchy in this world. The divide between the overlords and lackeys is tremendous. It's all mathematics and grids in this universe and I hear hundreds of chirping voices talking about killing and abuse, firing off from every angle of my mind. This is hell. Grids upon grids of the darkest parts of the human mind. This event tore me up physically and mentally. Remembering what happened still brings up feelings of dread and terror even nine months on. The message to take away from this is that always be aware of what you're taking, and if it's a choice between underdosing and overdosing, you can always redose later. What I put my loved ones through is regrettable and not a mistake I want to make twice. Submitted by Crypto TOR